you don't have core values, you don't know who you're going to align with, you're just going to find someone attractive in your life and be part of that 57% divorce rate when you realize, well, we don't share values on family system, on health, on finances, and you're like a fucking stranger to me. Why did I ever marry you? Well, it's because you never established core values intentionally in the first place. If you don't intentionally set your core values, values will be set for you typically low and typically destructive what is the number one reason for divorce money yep finances finances 57 percent divorce rate well it's no surprise if we don't teach children we're going to have ill-educated adults whether it's finances or core values remember adversity is your advantage Hey, my friend, welcome back to another amazing episode of the CEO Show with your host, yours truly, Bryce Henson, where I teach leadership, I promote capitalism, and I defend free speech. Another month, my man B back in the studio. Welcome back. Good to be back, Bryce. All righty, today, core values, leadership, the fabric of uh, business and life success. That's mm -hmm. the topic for today, my friend. Great topic. So uh, core values. Um, I didn't fully always know that the importance of those, but uh, we're going to talk a little bit about those today. My first question for you, B, is why are core values important to nations, organizations, companies, and then people? Individuals, yeah. Yeah, yeah I, I think we all need to realize that whether you have consciously have set value core values or not we all have values yeah. right if you look at all the cars that are parked in the parking lot every now and again you'll find one that looks like a dumpster you know soda pop cans burger wrappers old starbucks cups you just look inside of a car and you're like oh the values this person has set on themselves in terms of cleanliness are pretty low. So we all have values regardless. It's just you either have low values or values that are going to be damaging to your reputation, to your business, to your life, to your family, or you have to intentionally set core values that are positive. And when you do, whether you're a nation, you're a company, you're a um, individual, now you literally filter everything against the core values. Like think what we do here at Fit Body Bootcamp, right? We have our core values for Fit Body Bootcamp. Any new franchise owner that we bring on board has to jive and align with our core values mm -hmm. of who we are, how intense and passionate and driven and disciplined we are as an organization. You got to have a whatever it takes mentality and you got to own an extreme ownership. These are the values and the filters that we look for everyone in our company. Yeah. And here at the corporate level, we hire based on our core values. Mm -hmm. If you don't, again, align with our core values, then, and you come and work here, you're gonna be like, oh my gosh, these people are intense, they're extreme, <laughs> they're, they're, they're crazy, but then someone else who actually aligns with our core values to go, oh my God, I found my home, Amazing. right? So core values are everything you do. Like if you're looking for a mate in life, you're looking for a boyfriend or a girlfriend in life, someone that you're gonna make a spouse, you probably want to have your set of core values in the different areas of life pretty well articulated, maybe in finances, maybe in health and fitness, maybe in how we want to, how many kids we're going to have and where in the country we want to live. I mean, how often do we hear about people divorcing because, well, I fell in love with you. I didn't realize that you wanted kids. Mm -hmm. Like, how do you not talk about kids? You get married and then you go, ta-da, you want to have kids? No, not really. Like, what, what, wait, what? We never talk. Yeah, well, if, if it's valuable to you, if it's part of your core values to pass along a legacy, I want to leave kids behind when I die so they could do more good for this world than I ever did. Mm -hmm. I need to find a mate who can also be aligned with not only giving me children, but also helping me raise great children of similar core values and character. So values, whether it's for nation, corporation, or individuals, if you don't intentionally set your core values, values will be set for you, typically low and typically destructive. Yeah, amen to that. Uh, there's a famous quote. Um, if you don't stand for something, you'll fall for anything. Correct. And I think that's so important. And it's interesting, you mentioned you know, personalities, relationships, dating. Opposite is, opposites attract when it comes to personalities, but values connect long term. Yeah, and uh, you said it right there. When you're you know courting or dating a spouse, you need to make sure long term your values are aligned. I'll take my wife Tatiana for example. We have very different personalities. She's shy. She's introverted. She's like detail oriented, analytical in nature. Mm -hmm. I'm extroverted. Right. You know, um, very passionate, energetic. Very different personalities. Very, very different humans from a personality perspective. But when you look at us from a value perspective, we value the same things. We value wealth, prosperity, travel. 
um, free market capitalism. We value, you know, a lot of things to our core, and that's what makes the relationship work. And that's the same with companies as well. And uh, you know, the the famous, I guess, physiological um, phenomenon, the law of attraction, got brought to the stage. You know, the center stage. You know, a decade or so ago, mm-hmm. and everyone can buy into that. From my perspective, that's actually the core values in motion. That's actually gravity. It's a ground of physics perspective. People with the same values like gravity, they attract. So that's what I see. And that's the value, not only relationship, but also taking from a free market capitalism and entrepreneurship perspective, you got to have strong values as a company to be able to attract the right people. Yeah, agreed. Agreed. Well said. What do you think, B, kind of looking at my next question here, um, why are people lacking clarity in their core values? I'm curious on on your perspective. I don't don't think it's ever taught. It's never over taught. I mean, you know, a family might have this core values. Typically we go, well, you know, here's how things were in my family. Every Sunday we went to church and then every Wednesday we had uh, dinner together as a family. Well, th- those are values, believe it or not, but it was never overtly taught like, Hey, son and daughter, these are our five or 10 or 15 or 20 family core values. And when you move on, Uh, You can carry these core values along with you, or you can add to them, or you can find a set of core values that are best for you, but be sure to have core values. So they're not taught in schools. They're not usually taught by parents. And so we don't know what to do. We just, at some point we hear like, oh, values, core values, alignment. And we go, oh, shoot. And then you might at some point read a book like you know, traction or, or vivid vision Mm -hmm. by Cameron Harold. And then you start understanding values alignment, connection, like you said, personalities could be different, but Mm -hmm. values could align, but no one's out there teaching it to us when we're kids. Mm -hmm. And so how are we just like no one's teaching money management, no one's teaching money intelligence. And so kids grow up illiterate in terms of their money intelligence. They become adults who outspend what they make. Don't know how to balance a checkbook. Don't know how to balance a checkbook. Live in a state of debt. They have college debt. They have credit card debt. They have house debt. They have all this debt, um, you know, automotive debt. And then what is the number one reason for divorce? Money. Yep, finances. Finances, 57% divorce rate. Well, it's no surprise if we don't teach children, we're going to have ill-educated adults, Mm -hmm. whether it's finances or core values. Yeah. I mean, when I was putting together this question, my first thought was lack of intentionality, lack of education. I can't remember. It wasn't until my business career, meeting you, kind of getting in the working world, the business world, where like, oh, shoot, like core value is important. It was like a new, I guess, chapter in my life. And at first I thought it was interesting. But then as I've like peeled down the onion, not only from a company perspective, but also a personal Mm -hmm. perspective. And it wasn't until this past year, B, where I really did the work. And I'm actually going to talk a little bit about uh, an exercise that our audience can, you know, execute within track the book traction, the entrepreneur operating system to establish some core values. But I took a look, a deep look back and I was like, you know, I have company values, right? But what do I value as a person? What's Bryce's core value? And through an exercise that we'll talk about today, freedom is my core value. It's, yeah. the, it's the way I operate through the word. It's the filter that I look at. I certainly know we share we're kindred mm-hmm. spirits, right? Yep. Uh, f- value freedom and sovereignty. This is why you know we grow businesses. We look for financial freedom. We look for physical freedom. Uh, this is the, the, the metric of who I am. And it's important. Once you know who you are, then you can build, build the person, the human, the life, the business that you want to attain. Bingo. Bingo. That's exactly And by the way, you know, none of us are free range chickens. Like we are tribal animal, right? And so if you know exactly who you are and what you value, it's easy to find like-minded people. Like everyone in this room, as I look around, like we share very much core values. Yet, as I know everyone in here, I also know that we're all very different in personality. So while personality, we're very different in core values, we're all very aligned. And that is important because at the end of the day, if I'm a lone ranger trying to make it through life, it's a sad state. Like I might have a flat tire and I want to be able to call one of the four people in this room and be like, Hey guys, I'm on Carbon Canyon. I'm stuck. I got a flat tire. Can you come help? And so if you don't have core values, you don't know who you're going to align with. You're just going to find someone attractive in your life and be part of that 57% divorce rate when you realize, well, we don't share values on family system, on health, on finances. And you're like a fucking stranger to me. Why did I ever marry you? Well, it's because you never established core values intentionally in the first place. So be from your lens, where does, uh, 
someone's start. If they're listening to this or watching this, like, shit, man, I don't have core values. I don't even have core values as a company, let alone as a person. Like, where do I go from here? What would your advice be? Yeah, so I always tell people, like, if, if, if the whole idea of core values are too challenging, it's like, it's almost like a little too woo-woo up in the sky of an idea. I always tell people, hey, what are non-negotiables for you? Right. Everyone can be like, like, well, you know, I won't let anyone talk back to me, you know, like be mean to me. Okay, great. Like I have a lot of strange non-negotiables just because of the current lifestyle that I live. Right. I'm very busy, I have multiple companies and high demand for t- talking and speaking at events, et cetera. So I don't wash my cars. It's a non-negotiable. I don't wash my cars. I don't gas up my cars. Uh, I don't do grocery shopping. I don't change the light bulb in the house because we've got a full-time house manager mm-hmm. that does that. Um, I don't, I don't do the typical things. I don't go mow the lawn. Um, I don't do the typical things. Food comes to me. I don't go to a barber shop. Yesterday, I got a haircut. Eric comes to my office every 10 days upstairs. Mm -hmm. We've got a whole setup basically for me to cut my hair because during those 35 minutes that I'm getting a haircut, four people can come and sit in front of me, team members, and ask their questions, and we can move the company forward, right? It's an efficiency thing. It's a non-negotiable for me. I will not. Now, having said that, I also realize I'm traveling to Australia. I leave this Saturday, and then next uh, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, I speak in Melbourne, Brisbane, Sydney, and I realize, oh, guess what? Eric can't fly to Australia, so I am going to have to go to a barber shop. But so there are times that I will negotiate. But one of the best ways to start are what are things that you're willing to negotiate on, and what are non-negotiables for you, right? Like it's it's a non-negotiable for me. I must work out every single day. It's a non-negotiable for me. I must eat to make my body fueled in order to operate efficiently under the workload and stress that I have to deal with as a founder and CEO and leader, right? Um, I don't want to eat in a way where I'm foggy headed the next day or my body feels heavy or I'm hung over. And so when people are like, dude, you never had an alcohol problem. Why did you stop drinking two years ago? You only had a couple cocktails a month. Well, I stopped because into my forties, I realized uh, part of my values now is no alcohol because as I got into my 40s, even a couple cocktails at a cocktail party, I'd wake up a little fuzzy headed the next day, which means my workouts are suffering. My mind in terms of performance is suffering. And that means my businesses would suffer because a byproduct of it. And so I created another new core value as a byproduct of a non-negotiable. It is non-negotiable now. I will not drink. Someone's like, yeah, but it's our company's anniversary. I don't care. I'm not drinking. But it's your dad's, whatever, mom and dad's 67th wedding. I don't care. I'm not drinking. And I come from a culture, by the way, the Armenian culture, they toast to everything, right? And so, you know, (laughs) my culture, my family that I come from, we're like, what do you mean you stop drinking? Just have have a shot of vodka with this and save this toast. It can't. It ain't happening. And they're befuddled. Like, are you an alcoholic? No, I'm not. Do you have a problem with alcohol? No, I don't. Is it okay if we drink? Have at it. It's a non-negotiable for me. It's part of my new core values. So your core values are also things that are pliable. You can add new core values, just like you can add or take away new negotiables or non-negotiables. Love that. And if you're a alcoholic like me, a recovering alcoholic, you got to remove alcohol. You got to remove alcohol. Right. That's a non-negotiable, which be to your point, I think you brought something so brilliant. It's the way human nature processes the world through a negativity bias. And that's just through evolution survival. Right. But sometimes it's hard to understand what we like, but we know what we don't like. So the non-negotiable element makes it easier, makes it easier to that filter. Um, one exercise that uh, Brian Underhill, our EOS implementer, EOS, by the way, stands for Entrepreneur Operating System. It's a leadership operating system that we've installed in our uh, business since 2009, which has absolutely been a game changer. EOS talks about the value of core values that come from the leadership team because in the leadership, you're parenting the business. We talked a little mm-hmm. bit about parenting your children. Uh, they need to be challenged uh, every 90 days, and we have new leadership team to the organization. Well, then, hey, you have new parents leading the organization. You need to challenge those. So your challenges, to your point, can change over time. They can be fluid as you change, as you grow, as you experience more self-mastery. Um, but a really, really strong exercise um, because humans learn through metaphor, right? And yeah. this is your great storyteller, B. Um, that's great marketers are, is take a step back. And if you're having a hard time identifying what you value, think of someone, okay, that you really admire. 
write down the characteristics mm. you admire that person. Sometimes it's hard for us to think of these things in the abstract, but when we look to someone else, we can actually model that. We use them as a metaphor, if you will, and write down those characteristics. So that would be one aspect. Then they do the other side, the anti-value, if you will, because again, going back to the negativity bias, think of someone you absolutely hate. You cannot stand. Think of that person right now, write down the characters and qualities of that person, and then invert that which is actually taught to us by Warren Buffett, inverting thinking. Because again, through a negativity bias, a lot of times human nature can really identify things quicker in that fashion. And doing that exercise, you'll get a long list of qualities or characteristics that you quote unquote value. Bingo. And then you can whittle those down and ultimately find a set of value, a value or a set of values that really resonate with you that you can live with. What a beautiful exercise that is, man. And it's so simple to do that because as you make that list of someone that you look up to, admire, in other words, distill their core values that you admire so much and then go, oh, well, I'd like to have those core values. And then you look at someone who maybe you're not a big fan of and go, how do they carry themselves? And then if you realize, oh shoot, they do this thing that irritates me, yet I have that same thing about me. Well, then now you know what to let go of, a habit, a behavior, a, a vice, or whatever. And lo and behold, what you've got left underneath are the core values that you operate from. Yeah. Heck yeah. B, from your lens, um, how have they, how have adopting and living your core values really affected your leadership for the positive? Here's what I know about leadership, man. There is automatic leadership when you become the boss. Like when you're the CEO of a company, you, you are to be respected. Um, but that doesn't necessarily make you a great leader. When you're the founder of a company, you are to be respected. At least that's what we kind of hope, right? And, and say, hey, look at the corporate paperwork. It says me, founder, CEO, president. Well, okay, that doesn't mean that everyone's gonna respect you. We, I would hope so. If you have core values and you live by those core values, if you tell people, hey, hey team, these are my core values, and then you actually live by those core values, you're no longer a hypocritical leader. So there's two types of leaders. Leaders that are literally living by the words and the deeds that they say they do. And then the hypocritical leaders where they go, hey, we need to be focused and uh, on point. But then that leader shows up late, is not prepared, is rarely on point. And you're like, wait a minute, you're a hypocrite. You're a hypocrite. So to me, some of the best, most effective leaders are those who walk to walk and talk to talk. And those are the ones I admire. Those are the ones I respect. Those are the ones I want to be like. And those are the ones I will run through a burning wall for. And then those leaders, quote unquote, who share beautiful sounding core values, but don't live them, I immediately write off as hypocritical and as an imposter and I lose all respect for them. And I think everybody does that. I'm probably more vocal about it and I'll talk about it openly about <laughs> you? people. Yeah, right. <laughs> but, but I, I love you for that, yeah, by the way. Thank you. Right. I, I mean, look, everybody does that. Like you can walk into a room, if you have, val your values are fitness, I can walk into a room and I could see someone who's fit and immediately like put them in a higher ranking than someone who's not fit in that room. Mm -hmm. That's it. And people go, but you don't know the content of their character like Martin Luther King Jr. said. Shut the front door. <laughs> because I can tell you that that guy or gal who's fit has focus, enough focus to go and work out consistently. Uh, they have discipline to say no to fat, fatty foods and high carb and sugary foods. They know how to push themselves through pain and adversity of a workout, of a gym, of a, of a trail run, of pull-ups, of push-ups, of burpees. Like it tells me I can physically look at someone and go, aha, you have some of the core values that I admire. And I could look at the next person and go, aha, you gelatinous turd. You don't have the core values that I admire. And so on a ranking, I'm going to put the gelatinous turd lower than the person who's fit. Now, once they open their mouths and talk to me, that ranking may change, but oftentimes it doesn't. Amen to that. Um, something I value in leadership is discipline. And I heard this uh, actually from a new new friend. His name's Ben Newman. He used to work uh, as a mindset coach under uh, Nick Saban for a handful of years, won multiple national championships, actually did a guest keynote for our Legacy Tribe coaching group. And he said, you can only lead someone to the level of discipline that you lead yourself. Mm -hmm. and, and that was a mic drop moment. And it kind of circles back to what you talked about is leading by example from 
my terminology uses moral authority. When you walk your own talk, to me, that is the highest level of self-leadership and the highest level of leadership. And it's interesting, you know, people ask me all the time, Bryce, you know, you're such a great leader. How have you acquired those skill set? Well, you know, I have a lot of weaknesses. I have a lot of vices. I have a lot of character defects. But B, what I've learned is the best way to lead myself is to take a step back and build a person that I admire. Mm -hmm. And when you can build a person other people admire, that is the best way to influence others. When you break leadership down, leadership is influence and influence is leadership. And yeah, you can be, you know, to your point, you know, when you're a positional leader, say you start a company, you're the founder, you're the CEO, that gives you the position of leadership, but that doesn't actually truly give you influence. Right. Right. The only way you truly have influence for me, the best way I know how to lead, the best way I know how to influence, you know, my family, the best way I know how to have influence my company, my franchise partners, my coaches, my clients is build a person that I admire and then by living through moral authority, take action and people will follow. That's where influence lies. Yep. Uh, so this all also goes back to bringing about from a core value perspective, knowing who you are, knowing what you value and continue to build a person that you value. So well for said. me, that's where the value of core lies, of core values lie. Yeah, I agree. I agree. And that, that's why we got along so well. Amen. Yeah. Um, so I guess to bring this home, um, be from your perspective, what advice would you have for other leaders that uh, are listening to this right now? And they're like, yeah, you know what? I get it. I want to lead a life of you know, purpose, of substance. I want to lead a value-rich life. What's your action step? What's your recommendation here? Well, the first thing I would say is what I heard John Maxwell say in his 21 Irrefutable Laws of Leadership, or maybe it was in his other book. But anyway, John Maxwell, great leadership uh, um, trainer and and literally lives by his own teachings and he said sixes and sevens cannot lead eights and nines and that is so true yeah. right and so the, the the thing i want to leave the audience with is like find the areas not the areas that you're strong in but the areas that you're weak in like if you're if you're a leader in a business and you're like man i keep attracting employees who are just substandard and it's so frustrating Figure out what's so sub, what you don't like about them, and then look in the mirror. Odds are you are substandard in those categories that you don't like about them. Start leveling up because when you become a level eight or nine leader, you will attract the nines and tens. But until you become that eight or nine leader, you're not going to attract an eight or nine team member. You're going to attract a six or a seven or a four or a five. And so it's always easier to point outside and go, these people, they're not working as hard as me, or I keep attracting horrible people into my corporate office. And if only I could attract better employees, if they're just all bad people out there, my business would be bigger. Well, why is it that other businesses are thriving and yours aren't? Is it that only you have access to shitty employees? Or is it because like attracts like? Like a track like, my friend. Right? Amen to that. And actually, to give you a real-life example of this, B, and I've shared this you know, many times over, but I really want to drive that point home. In 2016, I had a thriving business, multiple locations. What I realized, I was hitting my leadership lid. And as it turns out, I'm an alcoholic. And I had a hard time realizing that for a long period of time because I wasn't the alcoholic that my father was, that I saw, you know, that lived under a brown, or excuse me, live under a bridge or drank alcohol daily out of a brown paper bag, um, who had, didn't have his poop in a group. I was a very high functioning alcoholic, right. always got my stuff done. But I realized that alcohol was not serving me well. And it wasn't until a dear a family member who I love dearly seeing her struggles and tri tribulations with alcohol and coming to the realization that I could do nothing more to help this individual who I love and care for with the exception of helping myself. I had that deep, that mirror moment that you just uh, yeah. talked about. And I looked in the mirror and I thought to myself, how can I ask something of someone else that I'm not willing to do myself? And B, that was a humbling moment. Mm. That moment was, in many ways, just a punch to the gut. But it, what it showed me is it gave me clarity. And I'm happy to report that was the last time I drank alcohol, December of 2016, where I can tell you a lot of times leadership is about subtraction rather than addition. Mm -hmm. And by subtracting that from my life, I was then able to overcome that battle in my life, lead a life of moral authority. And I'm still on that path, of course. Um, but you know, to be able to edify what you just said, that has been the biggest leadership lesson that I've experienced in life, and probably my biggest heroic message or hero heroic moment that has allowed me to be sitting in this table with you today. That's huge. That's huge. And and you know, wrapping this up, I can tell you my own experience of 
because again, leadership is not factory installed for me. You know, I imagine maybe you know, I always think of Jocko Willink and I'm like, man, you know, maybe he was just born a strong leader. You know, there's probably, you know, Winston Churchill born a strong leader. I don't know. Right. But I just see them as factory installed leaders for me. I, I was raised to be passive aggressive. I was raised to not question what my mom and dad said. So, you, you know, I, if you, they, you told me something and I think I understood, but I needed more clarity, I wouldn't come and ask you for clarity and therefore I would go do my work. And if it was poorly done and you get upset at me, I'd like, oh man, I, I let Bryce down. Um, you know, the, the more self-aware version of me would be like, excuse me, Bryce, I think I know what you want, but can you just show me an example of what you want so I can create it the way you want, right? Like self-leadership starts there. But um, I can tell you that because I was passive aggressive, factory installed leadership was not me because I was not a great communicator. Back in 2012, 2013, as we launched Fit Body Bootcamp, we were growing it. I had some team members who I felt were awful team members. I truly like labeled them as awful team members. I realize now as I look back, some of them had I led them well, would still be here today, mm. 10, 11 years later, mm. right? And so, but the rest of them, because I was an awful leader, I also attracted awful team members. And then the good team members that I had fired me so I could fire my bad employees, but the good employees fired me by quitting, putting in their two week notice and going and working somewhere else where they had a, a better leader who had clear vision and who was able to lead them through not only positional authority, but moral authority. Mm -hmm. I didn't have that. And so as I developed and built my leadership muscles, all of a sudden I attract some amazing human beings who all of a sudden want to work with me and for me to take my vision to the next level. And so I, I'm always reminded over and over again that because I know the 1.0 version, the 2.0 version of me and the 1.0 version was passive aggressive, mm -hmm. unclear in his vision, uh, poor communicator and um, didn't really lead by example. And then the 2.0 version, I spent a decade improving myself, working on my weaknesses, turning them into my strengths. And I'm telling you, it wasn't by coincidence that all of a sudden I started attracting nines and tens to work with me and take my vision to the next level. Amen to that. Well, I think to put a bow on that, B, uh, what I'm getting from this episode, core values are mission critical to your success as an individual, as an organization, as a nation, and leadership is always the problem. It's always the solution. And speaking of leadership, I have an awesome leadership course that I'd like to my audience to hear about, which is go to brycesensoncom forward slash leadership. Would love to be able to provide some leadership coaching there. How about that? Beautiful. All right, my friend. Well, hey, awesome episode. Appreciate you as always. Thank and you, friends, Bryce. remember, adversity is your advantage. If you got value from this, go ahead and like and subscribe, and we'll see you in the next episode.